hello viewers uh, this is the chronicle i am kebaje from and then welcome to this special edition of uh, exclusive with mustafa njai the ceo of uh, TAF africa global uh, mr njai welcome to the chronicle thank you so much Keba. yeah um, it's a pleasure to actually welcome you and then to say congratulations to this milestone achievement you have uh, celebrated 30 years of existence having established as a company in 1990 can you tell us how did it all start well, um, uh, it started, tough, tough, uh, tough construction started in 1990, and um, it was after I did my apprenticeship, working for others, being an employee for 15 years. Uh, immediately when I left school in 1975, I just started working. And um, uh, I worked from 1975 to 1990, which is 15 years. And then in 1990, I decided to take the bull by the horn and start up my own business. So it started as tough construction. Tough construction. And now the name has been metamorphosed, uh, if I understand, three or two times at least. Yes, uh, from tough construction, I mean, because originally when we started tough construction, we used to do private housing um, uh, for individuals and also did conventional construction, yeah. meaning tendering for works. And then um, uh, later we, yes, uh, metamorphosized to um, a tough holding company. Mm -hmm. But we, have, we had some other interests. Yeah. Interests like um, uh, in the hospitality business, we used to co-own a hotel called Tough Bell. Mm -hmm. We used to also sell building materials, uh, tough building material supplies. And also we did tough plant hire. So because we had um, all these um, that we were doing, we decided to have a conglomerate of um, uh, companies and called it Tough Holding Company. Mm. Now later, around 2004 or 2005 or beyond, um, uh, we, we also then, no, uh, sorry, 2011, okay. we then changed our name into Tough Africa Global. I mean, the reason being that we started expanding beyond the borders of the Gambia. And uh, for that reason, you know, we wanted to, you know, be branded as an African company, but with global interest. Mm. So 1990 to death is three decades. What could you remember? What can you remember as your greatest achievement that today, even tough is no more, God forbid, or maybe not now, actually. Um, what would be your legacy? How would people remember you? What projects have you initiated in these three decades that you feel that these are the greatest, these are the things that really stand out? Well, I mean, in terms of achievements uh, for works that I have done, um, in the Gambia, we are the pioneer of mass housing development. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And we started with, with Yarambamba, building 210 housing units. Then we um, came into Brufut and built uh, Brufut Gardens, you know, which is about almost 550 units. We had some other challenging and huge projects. I mean, like we built the... HIV and tuberculosis lab, the laboratory in MRC, yeah. which was highly technical and, you know, very detailed. And um, uh, although it's not in the public eyes or probably people don't see it, but um, uh, it was a good, it was a major achievement. But if I really look back in the Gambia, I think um, our major achievement that we always remember are the AU Villas. AU Villas. Yeah, because the AU Villas was in the manner that it was done. It, it took us, um, uh, the government wanted us to do it in six months. 52 presidential villas, not only building it, but also furnishing it. And we did it in four months. Up to now, people will ask, how was it done? You know, but, but I think that's a major one in the Gambia. Um, and then, I think that is the area that, is house, that housed um, African Union delegates. Yes, yeah, the presidents yeah. actually. We had about presidents. 42 presidents that were here. In 2006. 2006. Uh, we so. built it. We designed, built, furnished and managed it. So it's a major one. Uh, in the Gambia really, I think that stands out. Um, but apart from that, we've done quite a lot of houses. You know, we, we, will not, we cannot just exhaust the list. If you now look beyond the borders of the Gambia, uh, our major project, which is the biggest in all our business, is the project we did in Port Harcourt in Nigeria. It's in the south side of Nigeria, and it's a golf estate, 42 hectares. Uh, the land was very massy, it was a swamp. At high tide, the water can be as high as two meters. And we cleared the land and then sand filled it. And when we sand filled, we, we dredge the sand. We bring, bring a dredging plant 
in the, into the waters, into the river, and then pump the water, you know, at times at about two kilometers away from the site. And that the total that we pumped to date, it's about 650,000 uh, cub 650, cubic meters of sand that we, com com we pumped, compacted, and then built these units. And the total number of units that are there is about 1,200 units, together with a clubhouse, a golf course, um, a shopping center, you know, play area for kids, you know. So that's the most challenging and the biggest achievement we have ever had in our business. And then that, that um, is actually the venture uh, or initiative that actually propelled you until you renamed from Tough Africa Constru Tough Construction to... From Tough Africa, Tough Africa Global. That is where the transformation Yes, yes, yes. When, okay. we, when we were in Nigeria and other countries. We registered also in, in uh, six other countries. And that is uh, Mozambique, uh, Rwanda, um, uh, Cameroon, Togo, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Senegal, mm -hmm. you know. So because of all this, you know, we rebranded and then called our company Tough Africa Global. Yeah, so in your new vision, you talked about, I stand to be corrected, you talked about building one million homes. Yeah. One, one million homes. Yeah. In the Gambia within the space of? Uh, 20 years. 20 years. I mean, this is a, this is highly ambitious. How do you plan to carry this out? Well, first, I mean, if you want to do anything like this, one is to have a vision. There's nothing wrong with having a vision. Without a vision, you cannot deliver. And uh, we have a vision, and this is like, we want to define where we want to be as a, con as a business in the next 20 years. So we started it last two years, you know, and it's on, it's, it, it is on course. So first we identify what our challenges are. You know, if you want to deliver one million homes in Africa, I mean, you need to first get the land. So um, uh, every country that we are in, uh, we try and get the land. And the land, most of the time, we get it through PPPs, public-private partnership. So we don't go out and buy the land. So we forge partnership with the states or the governments, and then they will contribute the land as their equity. Once the land is contributed, we then raise the finance. You saw here, you know, yesterday, we signed a landmark MOU with uh, Shelter Africa. Shelter Africa is a pan-African you know, bank that deals with housing. And um, uh, it has shareholders, 42 shareholders, you know, uh, that, and the shareholders are all African governments, plus um, ADB and I think um, uh, Africa Re. So we are partnering with them as our financing partners. So they will lend us money to build and probably also lend also the off-takers, you know, like channeling it through a bank to the banks for them to, um, uh, to give out mortgages. So that's something that we have also sorted out. Then the other challenge that we need to address, that we, addre we are addressing now, is technical capacity. Because one million homes, if you build one million homes, you need a lot of workforce. And we are starting in the Gambia. In the Gambia, here we've identified that we need to start with, you know, about 1,000 units every year. Yeah, so for the next 10 years, probably, we, will, we, we want to build every year 1,000 units. You know, so um, I think all the jigsaw we have fitted out right now, and uh, we're rolling it out. You must have seen in Dalaba, we've just almost In fact, completed. I wanted to ask whether Dalaba, yeah. because I went there last time, whether Dalaba is actually part of this 1 million target. It is part of it, yeah, because we started this two years ago. We started it two years ago, and we did Tanje, we did some work in Tanje. Um, uh, we've also done Dalaba, you know, Dalaba is 374, so you know, 374 out of a thousand is a number. Um, and we are going to launch also four new estates, you know, so, um, um, and they are out there, it's called the, the Tulip Gardens, uh, the Lily Gardens, Muraya Gardens, and then, you know, Dalaba is part of it. Yeah, so we'll, we come back to the Gambia here. Um, where public-private uh, partnership has been, you know, considered. I don't know whether so-called, it has been so-called, you know, considered very important. I don't know whether in practice this is the case. How do you assess private sector relationship with Gambia government in terms of the responsibilities the government has towards private sector in at least uh, creating that um, development priorities in the country, considering particularly the unemployment 
rate in the Gambia for young people? Well, let me first tell you that, look, we have signed with the government of the Gambia on a public-private partnership project at the airport. That's Gaitaf. Gaitaf, yes. Gaitaf, um, the government provided the land only, and we are raising the finance. We're going to build it and manage it. And then there's a shareholding structure. So it's a PPP. So that, that is a PPP that has been launched. Now, uh, when you do PPPs, I mean, there are a lot of advantages that it has. Because government don't have the finances to invest in some of this infrastructure. So the private sector, um, given the way it is structured, can raise the money and do it. So, uh, yes, I will advise government, not only here, all over Africa, they should look into projects like this. Some governments are doing it better than the others. Our project, as I told you, in Nigeria, it's a PPP. And it's almost completed. It was since 2000, and we started it in 2013. And it's all done. The government didn't put one single cent or a dollar in it. We raised all the money, we built it, we managed it. And then because it's a company, it's a corporate body, there is a shareholding structure. So everybody will get its benefits based on your shareholdings um, uh, that you have in the company. Yeah, Nigeria is cooperating, but Gambia, how do you assess Gambia's situation, Gambia's uh, willingness to deliver? Well, in the, look, Gambia, I mean, uh, for me, uh, I have been in business here in the Gambia for 30 years. I have seen three governments. I have seen the government and worked with the government of Sadawda Kairaba Jawara. I have worked with the government um, of um, Yaya Jame. Now we are working with the government of, of, uh, of Adamabaro. Um, as we, we have our own um, structures, as I said, and um, how I see Gambia, we all know that you know Gambia, a new Gambia came into into being. What, 2017, you know, there is a lot of room to improve. There's a lot of room to improve, but there are also opportunities. There are opportunities that you know. Yeah. One so, so actually, there are oppor opportunities, but whether they are actually tapping it, do you really believe that they are making effort? is beyond lip service. They are really seriously committed. You know, let, me, let me tell you, you see, that's relative. You know, if you go and ask the government, they will tell you, yes, we are. Yeah, <laughs> so you, your, your, your my own opinion, let me tell you what they did. I mean, they did the National Development Plan. The National Development Plan, and I was part of um, the team that went to Belgium, you know, in, to present the National Development Plan to, to the donors uh, as a private sector member. And we had a pledge of $1.7 billion. Now, after a pledge is made, what you need to do is to put in the structures to make sure that these pledges are realized. Yes. And that is government's role to play. Certainly. If you talk to them, and really, I think you should go and talk to them and ask them how far they have so, gone. So and, you... <laughs> and, and monitor them. You know, I mean, look, we need to base things on facts. I cannot say here that, look, they are doing well or not, they are not doing well. I mean, there are parameters that will, and, and barometers that can measure them. You know, so if you look at, for example, if you ask me in terms of doing business, that I can tell you that the company's rate in doing business, which is ranked by the World Bank, is going down. Yeah. That, well, that is recorded. And, and, then, and then even the unemployment rate, you look at the youth folks, for, for instance, um, it was 38 point something, but now it has been increased, you know, to 41.5, 41 if I get it right. So, um, Despite having, or in spite of having that good document uh, called National Development Plan that actually won or attracted some pledges, you know, whether they have all received, all have, whether they have all been received or not, that's another thing. But then this has not actually been translated. There are facts that back that. You talked about this World Bank stuff, and then this youth employment uh, record is, is, is another fact that shows that, you know, instead of go reducing the dilemma, things are getting serious. Yes, so you know already. You know that. So I did not tell you. Yeah, so I need you know your opinion also. on that. Oh, my opinion. My opinion on what? What should be done? You know, because really the facts are there already. So if you want my opinion, you know, I am a very positive person. You do not ask me, okay, what should the government do? I will not now. I am, I am actually trying, trying to get your assessment. Yes. On government, government's performance in addressing problems like youth employment. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they need to do more. The government needs to do more to address youth, youth, youth unemployment. Youth un unemployment is very high. And again, you know, because I'm an African player, this is across Africa. And African governments need to address youth, youth um, unemployment. So probably if you ask me further, I can give you how I think that they can do it.
But that is a fact. That is a hard fact. Youth unemployment has been around for a very long time, and the government should really concentrate, you know, on you know bringing in initiatives and investments that will now reduce youth unemployment. Yeah. So that will take us to another topic that is the proliferation of um, real estates in the Gambia. And then it's a massive development, but then it comes with certain risk also, and then certain threats, not only to environment, but even to people who are living within you know, certain areas. Because already we have seen communities going against each other, one another, that this is my land, they have taken my land. So it has become a problem. So I'm just putting it across that uh, we have a development that is the proliferation of um, real estate. But then the challenges, these are the, also the challenges. You know, you are into this business. Okay, you want my view on this? I mean, yes, there is a prol proliferation of so-called real estate developers or estate agents, you know. You need to break it down. Okay. Because the proliferation is more what you call real estate agents. Yes. They are mainly agents. They are not developers. Okay. I would ask you to go around and show me one estate that has been developed so, by this so-called... So, so we generalize it, we say agencies now. Yeah, they are agents. Is, Look, yeah. we are not agents, we are developers. And we have proven, if you ask whether Tap is a developer or not, you can point to Yarambamba, you can point to uh, Brufut, you can now point to Dalaba, Tanje. So we have developed. But just go around and see how many other estate agents or estate players have you seen an estate developed? There's none. So we are a developer. Now, if you want me to go further on the issue of proliferation of real estate agents, there is a reason for it. Because there's a demand. There's a demand because people need land, people need to live, people need to build. So these people are now capitalizing on this demand. They have seen that people, some will go and buy land from the community. Remember, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a responsibility of all the players. Yeah. The community, they need the money. You know, and these are being exchanged for millions and millions and millions of dollars. So they go and buy, buy this land from the community and then you know, start dividing it into parcels. We don't do that. We develop. We put infrastructure and develop. And also, we mitigate all the environmental hazards. If you go to Burford Gardens now, we have planted 600 trees. So whatever bush that was there, or whatever tree that was there, with the trees that we planted are much more than what existed. Same thing in Dalaba now. If you go to Dalaba, we are going to plant a total of 150 trees. So we mitigate the environment. We are quite aware of this. But if you want to address the sector and mitigating all this, there needs to be regulations. And the regulator is government. Government put, must put in place a regulatory framework, you know, for the, into the sector. Good example is uh, utilities and also uh, telecommunication. Pura, which is the public utilities and regulatory authority, is the one that regulates them. So government is high time that they put in a regulatory body, you know, to regulate this real estate sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you talked about Brookwood Garden, uh, and then there, are, there have been noise around this uh, Brookwood Garden. Of course, your project, um, but then people claim that uh, the project, when you were acquiring that land, it was not all clean. You know, you, 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 deal, you dealt with the former government, you know, in an ill, you know, quote-unquote, in an unhealthy you know, relationship, you were both having that. That led to your accusation to that piece of land, and to that land actually, and then you ended up developing it. What, how do you, what do you have to clarify this? But you know, it's always good when you, when you ask questions about these things, you come up with facts. Yeah, but then even today I'm seeing this thing on, on social yeah, media. Look, people have opinion. Yeah. You know how many so what things... Do you say but, no, hold on, hold on first. We must put things right. If you come to me, if I come to you and accuse that, Keba, I heard that you were drinking alcohol last night. Yes. I can say that, and today with media and social media, some people will believe it. I should probably take a camera and even take a picture of you or bring evidence that, yes, this is my evidence. Let me learn. Look, the issue of Bootfoot Gardens and what, the way we acquired it, I don't think it will never go away. Because in some quarters, it is an assumption. It's an opportunity to clarify. Yes, no, no, look, I've clarified it over and over and over again. 
And let me just generalize that the land allocation is not only been given to TAF. Where we are sitting now, the Sheraton, was it part of Burfoot? The Sheraton was part yeah. of it's where in Burfoot. Mm -hmm. And who owns the Sheraton? It's owned by Karafi, a Kuwaiti. It was allocated to them. Government allocate land. I cannot just go and grab or take any land. Government allocates a land. And the land was allocated to us. The land was within the TDA. There is evidence. If anybody, with all this that you are saying, nobody has ever come up with any hard fact. Look, we are living in the world of technology. If there's anybody who has any document that justifies their ownership, let them produce it. If you go through the files in, in, in local government and lands, I will tell you, I remember the process. There were the community we are compensated. There are laws and regulations on how it should be done. And I can tell you, I cannot speak for the government, but I will tell you that it was done. And it's in records. You know, you cannot, you cannot play around with these things. And remember, all the time, I've heard this before. Oh, when Yaya Jame leaves here, the land will be confiscated back again. Yaya Jame has been away for three, three years now. Has it been confiscated? Good. It was, it was, and just for the camera again, the land was allocated to us, like the way land is allocated to anybody here, because we are an investor. We brought money in, we were financed then by Shelter Africa, you know, and we, 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 we developed, created employment, and created a better infrastructure within the Buf community. What people think, well, if they have evidence, the courts are now very fair, I think they should march to the courts. Okay. If you accuse me now that I own you, that you own this here, what do you do? Go and prove ownership. Go to the courts. This thing has been going on for a very long time. So why are they, what are they waiting for? Whoever's claiming it, why are you waiting to take me to court? You have evidence that it's yours. Go to court and take it back. Isn't it fair? If anybody claims now your equipment, how do you prove it? Who's the judge? <laughs> yeah. huh? It's the court. Yes. You must start court, fighting. Court, yeah, that, that, that is a fact I can state. Yes. yes. You have to, people must learn that if they have any genuine claim for anything, you go to the courts. Take a lawyer. Go to the courts and claim your, 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 what, what you own. Yeah. Yeah, so also I'm just taking you around some of the rumors because this is a, here is an No, rumor, you know when you take rumors, yes. me, I don't, because yes. if you want to start rumors, you will never finish. <laughs> Every no. day there are rumors. But so then maybe you need to clarify. Okay, but go ahead. It were actually, there was a talk that, you know, tough, one time big gun in the Gambia, who is a real son of this country, left the country. And then people connected this thing to a problem that emanated uh, between you and the former president. This led to your uh, departure from this country until 2017 when you re resurfaced. Actually, I'll give you my speech and they will tell you exactly how I developed myself and we're still developing. That I had always thought when I went into business that the country is too small for what I want to do. So it's very strategic. I expanded beyond this country. I, I mean, that, that's me and my vision and people are seeing it. You know, so it was nothing to do with any problem with anybody. And I never left the country. I always live in the country. But I saw opportunities outside of the country and I exploited them. But you know, rumors in the Gambia, you will never get away with it. But people who are probably idle are the ones who spread rumors. So you were there are, here? There are always facts. You can always find out facts. If you Google me up, you'll find out a lot about me. But basically, to answer this, I saw opportunities beyond the borders of the Gambia and I exploited them as a businessman. And then that, uh, that vision led to your expansion in other part of the Africa. Yes, I said as it. You, as you explained. Yeah. yeah. My vision today is to develop one million homes and it's across the Sub-Saharan Africa, not only Gambia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's true. So where do we see TAF in the next 20 years? I have said it. 20 years we are going to apart build one million housing, homes apart for my from foundation. Housing. I have said it. If you are around, you will see what I've said and what we are the doing. The foundation, yeah. The foundation, I've seen that you developed a crop of uh, 
people, young, young folks actually, who are very aspiring, inspiring to uh, become leaders of this country. What, what actually, why, why that talk? But I want to leave a legacy. I have said it. I've said this thing and I can give you actually our, our, our concept note. It's all well detailed and well structured. I said it was in my closing remarks. That look, I retired from hard work two years ago. Because I have a structure now. All that you see happening, even this conference, is, began, is being organized by my team. I cannot do all this by my own. So I thought about this. And there is continuity in my business. I started it. So now I am gradually retiring from active construction and business and development. But now giving back to my community and the country through my foundation. And I have seven different initiatives within this foundation. And I can give you the concept note so you can, you can see everything that is there. One of them is TAFCON. And you have seen the effect of TAFCON. Because we believe, I believe, that when you are successful in a country like the Gambia, you need to give back. But giving back structured. So people come to me all the time. Some people come and oh, please, can you give us donation? Or can you do this? Can you do that? That's not sustainable. What is sustainable is to have a proper structure and make sure that you invest in the future of this country. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, so it is also expected that you should develop beyond combos. Maybe you young? Should, uh, beyond combos. Your intervention, like your projects, it would be highly appreciated in other parts of the country. Um, at least even for no reason, but then it will promote you know, tourism, you know, the visit of tourists. You know, tourism in this country, it will boost that sector. Do you have this thing in your plan? I do have it in my mind. But you know, business is based on supply and demand. If there's a demand in of course, wherever in the, in the Gambia, we will go there. But if there's no demand, you cannot develop it. But there are schemes to develop it. Like, for example, in Upper River today, you can see all the infrastructure being developed. You know, and that's been done by government through the Chinese um, aid. Um, bridges are being done, roads are being done. Now, then, you know, things like housing will follow, but it's based on demand. If we go now to Cantora uh, and start building what we are building in the Combos, who will buy it? If they cannot buy it, who will finance you? You will go under. So business is based on supply and demand. But we are aware of this, and that is why the development that we are doing now is not only in the proper Combos here. We have now land as far as, as Gunjur, as far as we are looking at around the Pirang, and the Faraba area. Because in the next few years to come, people are going to live there and even travel all over. So we are very futuristic, you know, and, uh, but you plan it and you strategize. You cannot do all. I mean, uh, I have just one Gambian, one Mustafa Njai, in a population of over two million people. I can do my own bit, but there are others who will come in. I cannot also do all within my generation and my lifetime. I started it I will go, as you said, you know, when time comes, uh, as we pray, let it be very late. But, you know, I play, I play my role and move on. There were people before me who were here, who have done their bit and they've gone. So I can't do it all. So sustainability is a problem in terms of managing companies like this. Are you working towards that? How, how do you, how are you working towards that? You know, even TAF is no more today. This company, oh, you have company seen it. You, you know, look, look, you have seen it. TAF, actually, I have one. I have directors. I have a board. I have a chair. You know, TAF Africa Global, as you can see, the whole conglomerate. I am not the chairman. Dr. Karamo Sonko, who's living in Sharjah, in the UAE, is the chairman. And it's on record. Then I have directors, so I report to a board. I am, yes, maybe the majority shareholder, but I report to a board like all the properly structured corporate bodies. Outside of, outside of the Gambia, I mean, if every business I operate, I only own nothing more than 50, 55 percent. The rest, I have other shareholders. I have a board, I have a chair. So it's well structured, I mean, and my staff, the management, they are well structured. As I just told you, everything that you see around is being done by my staff. They have responsibilities. They are employed to do these things. And they fulfill that. My role is as the CEO. I sit at the top, I look at strategies, and then I assess them, you know, and play my role as the chief executive officer. But everything else, we have, you know, staff that are doing it. Thank you, Mr. Mustafa Njai, CEO of uh, TAF Africa Global. We are very pleased to have this interview. Thank you so much. And then we are very happy, delighted mm -hmm. that you granted this uh, space, you know,
for, for us, the Chronicle. We really appreciate it. So thank you very much, viewers. That does it for this special edition, um, which is actually featuring Mr. Mustafa Njai, the CEO of, of TAF Africa Global. Until next time, bye-bye.